Hello, and welcome to this APGO basic science video about the embryology of common malformations. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the development of the embryo and germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, understand the critical periods in embryogenesis and how these correlate with the development of particular malformations, define the terms describing congenital anomalies and patterns of malformations, and identify the factors that affect embryogenesis and the mechanisms that alter normal embryogenesis. Hi, Dr. Smith. I saw your first patient, Ms. Cooks. She's a 33-year-old that comes in for preconception counseling. To be honest, I'm not sure why she's here. I mean, she hasn't even tried to get pregnant. Wouldn't she just go to her internal medicine doctor to discuss any issues she has with her diabetes or seizure meds? Hey, Sam. Thanks for looking at Ms. Cooks' chart. Preconception visits are actually very important. Most embryogenesis happens before many women even know that they're pregnant. It is especially important for patients such as Ms. Cooks, who has medical conditions that, if not well controlled, could put a future pregnancy at risk. Why don't you go home tonight and review your embryology? We could talk about it tomorrow. Okay, so the embryonic period is from week 1 to 8, and then the fetal period goes from week 9 to birth. Hey Sam, how could you have totally forgotten all the embryology I taught you your first year? I guess we're going to have to start from the beginning again. During week one after fertilization, the embryo begins to divide. The embryo goes from two cells to Morula on day three and early blastocyst on day four. At the blastocyst stage, the cell begins to segregate into an inner cell mass, which is the embryoblast and the outer cell mass, the trophoblast. The trophoblast continues to the placenta and begins the implantation process. During week two, the blastocyst is partially embedded in the endometrium. The trophoblast differentiates into the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast. The embryoblast forms a bilaminar disc called the epiblast and hypoblast. The extra embryonic mesoderm splits into somatic and splanchnic layers. Subsequently, two cavities are formed, the amniotic sac and the yolk sac. Okay, this is starting to come back to me. I remember week three is coming, and that is when the trilaminar germ disc develops. You are absolutely right. During week three, the trilaminar germ disc develops. Gastrulation begins with the formation of a primitive streak and primitive node. The epiblast cells invaginate to form endoderm and mesoderm. Those that do not migrate form the ectoderm. The notochord forms from the endoderm to produce the midline axis or basis of the axial skeleton. The endodermal cells in the hypoblast express head-forming genes. There is a cascade of genes and molecules to signal the formation of laterality of the mesoderm. Especially important is the neurotransmitter serotonin, or 5-HT, which regulates the nodal gene for normal left-right organ positioning. Tissue and organ differentiation begin in the cephalocaudal or head-to-tail direction. The embryo's trilaminar disc contains all three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Let's pause, think, and apply. During week three of embryonic development, what fetal anomalies might result from the disruption of the neurotransmitter 5-HT? Disruption of 5-HT might interrupt regulation of the nodal gene that is responsible for normal left-right positioning of organs, thus resulting in laterality defects, such as the situs inversus, dextrocardia, or heterotaxy. An example is hypoplastic left or right heart syndrome in which laterality specification of the left and right cardiac progenitor cells is disrupted early in cardiac development. Now let's take a closer look at the three germ layers. Remember, we have now moved into the embryonic phase at this point. The ectoderm gives rise to organs in contact with the outside of the body. These include the central and peripheral nervous system and sensory epithelium of the ear, nose, eye, and skin. It also includes the pituitary, mammary, and sweat glands, and even tooth enamel. The mesoderm gives rise to the paraxial, intermediate, and lateral plates. The paraxial somites 
give rise to supporting tissues of the body, muscle, cartilage, bone, and dermis of the skin, as well as vascular system, urogenital system, spleen, and adrenal cortex. Endoderm gives rise to the epithelial lining of the gastrointestinal tract, respiratory tract, urinary bladder, tympanic cavity, and auditory tube, as well as the parenchyma of the thyroid, parathyroids, liver, and pancreas. Let's consider the major landmarks of the early embryonic period. Over weeks three to four, there is rapid development, fusion and closure of the neural folds, and simultaneously, the lateral folds move ventrally to close the body wall. Over weeks five to seven, the heart and kidneys mature. Over weeks five to eight, the head increases in size and the formation of the limbs, face, ears, nose, and eyes occurs. During this time, there is also sexual differentiation of internal and external genitalia. By week 10, intestines have rotated and returned to the abdominal cavity. Okay, this is all a great overview, but I'm not in the first year anymore. How is this going to help me answer Dr. Smith's questions tomorrow? Without knowing normal development, you will not be able to understand predictable insults at a given gestational age. There are critical periods of development during embryogenesis, and insults in specific time points can lead to predictable consequences. During the first two weeks after fertilization, this time span is considered to have an all or nothing response to teratogens, in that any large insult will cause either cell death and subsequent abortion, or will allow for the continued development of a normal embryo. Weeks three through eight are known as embryogenesis or organogenesis. This is a critical period for normal development of most major organs and organ systems. It is also the period during which insults can induce structural anomalies. After eight weeks, the fetal period represents a time of cell differentiation and growth. Disruptions may cause minor malformations, alteration in growth patterns, or functional abnormalities. Okay, so now I understand why it's important to know sequence of development, but you keep mentioning insults. What type of insults are you talking about? In the general population, there's approximately 2 to 3% incidence of major malformations and 7 to 10% incidence for minor malformations. There are different ways insults can affect embryonic development. Insults can cause cell death and apoptosis, alteration of cell migration and tissue growth, interference with cell differentiation, and alternation of normal metabolic processes. The two major types of insults include genetic alterations and teratogen effects. Genetic abnormalities can be whole chromosome, single gene, or non-Mendelian. Chromosomal abnormalities usually affect multiple organ systems, especially the central nervous system. Single gene mutations can be autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or sex-linked. These may have more limited scope in altering embryogenesis. Finally, non-Mendelian patterns of inheritance, such as imprinting, can also be seen in conditions such as Beckwith-Weedman syndrome. It is thought that 50% of all conceptions end in a spontaneous abortion during the first trimester. Half of these may be due to a chromosomal abnormality. Without this natural screening process, the incidence of birth defects could be as high as 12%. The next category affecting embryogenesis is teratogens. These may either be directly teratogenic on the developing embryo or indirectly teratogenic caused by a maternal condition which affects embryonic development. Drug exposure and environmental teratogens account for 2 to 3% of all malformations and depend on four main factors. One, the ability of the teratogen to cross the placenta. Two, the physical properties of the teratogen. Three, placental factors allowing for teratogen transfer. And finally, four, timing of exposure. Infections can also be teratogenic. These agents can invade fetal tissue and cause inflammation, as well as cell death. Common examples include exposure to the torch viruses, which are toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes, parvovirus, and Zika virus. Common signs noted during fetal surveillance include growth restriction, calcifications within organ tissue, 
cardiac malformations, and limb hypoplasia. Physical agents can also present as teratogens. Consider primary radiation exposure or intense heat. It is known that maternal fevers or high temperatures in hot tubs can be associated with neurotube defects and microcephaly. Excessive ionizing radiation can lead to malformations caused by cell death, decreased growth, chromosome disruptions, gene mutations, and malignancy. Indirect teratogens usually are the result of toxic antibodies or metabolites from mom that are transported across the placenta to the fetus. The most well described being poorly controlled diabetes. These embryos are exposed to elevated maternal blood sugar levels and have increased risk of cardiac anomalies, spina bifida, renal, and caudal regression anomalies. Thanks so much for taking me through the embryology again. I guess I should have tried to retain the information better, but I just didn't see the relevance the first time around, except to remember long enough for step one. One last question. There are so many different anomalies. How do you know when something is a deformity or a malformation or a syndrome? I am glad you understand the importance of foundational knowledge. Those terms all have very specific meanings. You can consider the induction mechanism or the pattern of the anomaly. If you consider induction mechanisms, the following are commonly used terms. Malformations are organ or body part abnormalities that occurred intrinsically during development. An example of which is autosomal dominant ectrodactyly. Deformations are alterations in the position of body parts from extrinsic mechanical forces in the uterus, such as limb contractures with anhydromnios. Disruptions, such as terminal limb defects or renal agenesis, are due to interference with vascular development. And finally, dysplasia, such as renal tubular dysplasia seen with ACE inhibitor, may occur as a result of interference with normal cell organization into tissues. You can also group anomalies by the pattern of presentations. Syndromes, such as fetal alcohol syndrome, have a series of features that are seen together and rarely in isolation. Sequence anomalies result from an insult in development at one point in time, and then the subsequent structures to follow. An example is radial dysplasia. Field defects affect a specific region, such as an acropectororenal field defect. Finally, associations are seen in conditions such as a vectoral association. Looks like it's time to rise and shine! Wow, that was an amazing dream! I am definitely ready to talk to Dr. Smith about our preconception patient today. Let's pause, think, and apply. When Sam thinks about Mrs. Smith, what is the biggest concern with her continuing to take Valproate during her pregnancy? How could she mitigate this risk? Valproate interferes with the folate metabolism and folate is necessary in the post-translational methylation of the cytoskeleton in neural cells during neural tube closure. Therefore, folate deficiency or abnormal metabolism is thought to play a role in the development of spina bifida, particularly during weeks three to four of embryogenesis. To mitigate this risk, the patient can take folic acid supplementation prior to conception and throughout this critical period of development. This concludes this APGO basic science video about the embryology of common malformations. You should be able to Describe the development of the embryo in germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Understand the critical periods in embryogenesis and how these correlate with the development of particular malformations. Define the terms describing congenital anomalies and patterns of malformations and identify the factors that affect embryogenesis and the mechanisms that alter normal embryogenesis. Thanks for watching.